Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, so let me share just one anecdote from, from 2010, as long as Tim mentioned my uh, run for office. Um, so I was had the, the, the great honor of being endorsed by three of the, the four living former governors at the time. And I thought it was interesting in how each endorsed me in a way that, that I think typifies his style and approach to politics. So Al Qui, um, we were at the, the state capitol get together doing a, a press conference on an issue that only Al Qui and I and a handful of lawyers care about, judicial reform. And in the middle of it, Al Qui stops and turns to me and says, you know, I'm going to endorse Tom Horner. This will be the first non-Republican I've ever endorsed for, for office. Arnie Carlson, Arnie still likes all of the bells and whistles of politics. And so with Arnie, we put together rallies in a number of cities, got a lot of people on buses and went around and did all of these you know, big balloon releases and news conferences, ended up on the, the steps of the state capitol with a, a big show. And, and uh, Arnie loved it, I loved it. You know, he still likes all of the hoopla of, of politics. Jesse Ventura endorsed me on Geraldo Rivera. <laughs> <laughs> And I had to assure my wife that it would be the first and only time that my name ever would be mentioned on Geraldo Rivera's program. <laughs> well, I understand that you had a terrific panel on the, the elections, um, and I hope that uh, they were able to, to tell you what actually happened, because about the only thing that I got out of the, the campaigns, um, and particularly the campaign advertising, is that um, Dayton seems to be out of touch. McFadden knows every tax haven in the world. Franken can't back up a boat into the lake. And Jeff Johnson's real first name appears to be Tea Party. <laughs> Other than that, I'm not sure that we've learned a lot. And I think that is a challenge. And I think it's particularly a challenge for Greater Minnesota um, when you don't create a mandate for governance. I think one of the problems of, of the amount of money and special interest groups coming into politics is that it, it has distorted the conversation. It has pushed candidates and voters, I think, to, to more extremes. And it has overwhelmed the need for a discussion about the issues. It has overwhelmed the need for candidates to put forth a vision and made it more and more difficult to move from campaign to governance. And I think with all of the issues that Greater Minnesota faces, I think that is going to be a huge challenge. And so let me talk a little bit about the uh, study that, that Tim referenced, because even though it was done um, two years ago, I think it, it certainly still is, is relevant. And in fact, I think that it, it was a preview of a lot of things that we've seen played out in the, uh, the last couple of years. So as Tim said, um, this was a study sponsored by the Center for Rural Policy and Development. Most of the work was done in um, summer and fall of 2012 with publication of the report in, in early 2013. Um, we did research in a variety of ways. We did a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews. We did an online survey to over a thousand um, people who are in positions of some influence throughout greater Minnesota, legislators, business leaders, city and, and county leaders, um, talked to a lot of folks, did a review of the, the news media for the last couple of years to see how issues are playing out, and then put all of that together to, to come up with, with some findings. And, and it was noteworthy that the publication of the research coincided with the speech that the uh, Secretary of Agriculture, um, Tom Vilsack, gave to a farm forum at, at the time. And he said this, that rural issues and concerns are becoming less and less relevant to the politics of the country. And we had better recognize that, and we better begin to reverse it. And I think Vilsack was right. I think it's dangerous. And I think we ought to pay attention to that. So let me give you some of the key findings, just the, the headlines, and then go back and talk about a couple of those that, that I think are, are most important. So as I said, we asked a number of, of influencers, those people who um, 
have some significance in your communities, what they think are some of the important trends and issues that, that they see occurring in rural Minnesota and how it affects rural, how they affect rural Minnesota's influence. And we found a, a, a couple of significant ones that were pretty consistent. The first, no surprise to you, is that the, the population changes, both the declining population as well as the aging population, is, is playing out in significant ways. And in fact, when we asked these influencers um, a, a whole series of potential um, issues that, that were affecting rural Minnesota's impact on state policy, this is the issue that was ranked far and away number one, the declining population and followed close behind with the, the aging population. Um, I think there's, there's another angle to this that, that I found particularly significant, is that it's not just the, the aging population and the declining population in rural Minnesota, but it's also that more and more metro residents no longer have roots in rural Minnesota. As Tim mentioned, I worked for, for Dave Durenberger from the time he was first elected in 1978 through the mid-80s um, at a time when uh, a lot of, of rural Minnesota farms were in serious crisis. Um, we, we had the you know, twin evils of double-digit inflation, double-digit interest rates. We had the in the late 70s, early 80s, the second of the big energy shocks, the oil shock, and, and farmers were really in crisis. Every survey I saw around what should we do for, for rural Minnesota, what should we do for farmers, there was more support for government intervention, direct government intervention in helping farmers coming from metro Minnesota residents than there was from rural Minnesota residents. I don't think that would be true today. And so it's not just the declining population, it's how the population has shifted. It's the population change in, in metro Minnesota that also, I think, is affecting the, the influence of greater Minnesota. Secondly, um, the, the people we talked to pointed out how statewide organizations with the greatest power increasingly not just are, are centered in the Twin Cities, but more and more ignore issues affecting rural Minnesota. And I'll come back and talk about that a bit more. And, and thirdly, um, we're, we're increasingly electing rural Minnesotas, uh, rural Minnesota legislators who have close ties to an ideology, in some cases more than a geography. And I'll talk a bit more about that. And then fourth, um, they, they pointed out, and this is a, a theme that was consistent throughout all of the research, is how fragmented the voices within rural Minnesota are. That there's no single unifying voice. And that becomes a, a huge problem. In addition to what the, the influencers told us, we found three other things that, that I think are significant. Um, the first is the, the transition in Minnesota's economy. So the industries that traditionally have been most important to, to rural Minnesota, farming, timber, mining, manufacturing, um, are less important to the overall state's economy. And we saw that reflected in a lot of the, the media coverage around the economy in how a lot of policy makers and others talk about the state's economy. Um, secondly, uh, the changes that are occurring in mainstream media are diminishing the influence of, of rural Minnesota. And I'm going to come back and talk about that. And then the political changes. And as I know, you, you did hear the, the panel, they talked a lot about uh, this interesting trend that um, we saw uh, in the elections this year where at the legislative level, at least, um, rural Minnesota now is, is predominantly Republican. The urban centers, the first and second rings, uh, ring suburbs are predominantly um, Democrat with that blew up in northeastern Minnesota that will remain there for a while. Um, so let me pick up there. Those are the headlines. Let me talk a little bit about um, what some of those findings mean and how they get the, translated. You know, it, it was encouraging that the, the um, presumptive speaker of the House coming into the, the new session, Kurt Dowd, um, in his first appearance before the media, gave a speech that, that Men Post headlined, House Republicans to Twin Cities, it's not about you. 
And I think Republicans are going into to the session feeling very, very strongly that it is no longer just about the Twin Cities. Not that they're going to be excluded, but it does have to be a conversation about the whole state. And that's encouraging, but it also comes with a lot of challenges. When you look at what happened 10 days ago in, in the elections, it's not just that, that you have this huge split, although that is significant, 44 out of the 62 Democrats who will be in the House of Representatives come from either the central cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, or the first and second ring suburbs. 44 out of 62, and most of the rest are from northeastern Minnesota. When you look at what happened in, in the first and second ring suburbs, you had this huge Republican wave election that didn't affect that, that area at all. Democrats who should have been very vulnerable, Democrats who largely were elected in 2012 on the basis of the turnout that we had driven both by the presidential election and by the, the amendments, particularly the marriage amendment that, that were on the ballot. In case after case, when you look at Egan, both the dynasties, Minnetonka, elected with small margins and all of them re-elected. Look at the other seat in, in Minnetonka that, if it truly was a wave election, should have gone Republican. You had a contest between a very liberal Democrat and, and openly liberal, um, Sid Applebaum, and, and um, a very moderate Republican, Ryan Rutzik. Good candidate. Wasn't even close. It was like 53-47 that the Republican lost. That's pretty significant. And so one of the things I looked at was, look at the Secretary of State race. I mean, in many ways, that's a race that really reflects base turnout. You had three credible candidates, including the Independence Party candidate, and three unknowns. No money, no big issues. I mean, th th that's the kind of race where, where people go in and they tend to vote their party. Now, in the same way that there's a little bit of a bias to the Democratic candidate in the Attorney General's race, there's a little bit of a bias to the Republican in the Secretary of State race. But even with that, the Democrat won, 47, 46%, pretty even. And I think that's a true reflection of, of Minnesota. Severson, the Republican, won some of the first and second ring suburbs, did pretty well in the metro area outside of the, the two cities. Um, Simon, the Democratic candidate, the eventual winner, did fairly well in rural Minnesota. He, he won or came within three percentage points in about one third of the counties outside of the 11 county metro area. Not bad. But yet, with that kind of base election, with those kinds of candidates drawing from their bases, and I think really reflecting where the, the Democratic, the Republican base is in, in Minnesota, we haven't had a statewide Republican candidate for Senate or governor in the last 20 years who's been able to get above the, the low to mid 40s. I don't think that the, the, the Republican win in the House, notwithstanding, I think the future is, is very, very challenging, particularly for the Republican Party. Look what's going to happen in six years and go back to one of the concerns that influencers raise. Population in your community, many of your communities, in the region as a whole is declining. In six years, we draw new district boundaries for legislators. There are going to be fewer legislators coming from outside the metro area than there are from the metro. And right now, that seems to be pretty blue. It, I think, speaks to the need for, and Tim and I were talking about this, the need for Republicans in the House of Representatives to say, we need a positive agenda. We need to get things done. This can't be a legislative body that just plays to the, the base, that just speaks to 
um, the issues that, that core Republicans want us to speak to. And yet, you know, there's a challenge. And the challenge is, there are a lot of, of people in greater Minnesota who really do embrace a lot of the, the, the Republican ideology, including a lot of the, the social conservatism. And so we heard a number of, of people say in our research, um, what we don't like is that Twin Cities metro ideologies are being imposed on all of Minnesota. What we want is a way to sustain the values and traditionals of rural life as we have come to know them in, in Minnesota. And that gets reflected in, in what we see in politics. We go back to 2012, to the, the constitutional amendment on, on marriage. Keep in mind that that amendment was defeated statewide but it lost in only 11 out of the 87 counties. 76 counties passed that amendment. And in most of those counties, in more than 50 of those counties, not only did the amendment pass, it passed with more than 60% of the vote. It wasn't even close. There's the gap. You have those 11 counties, most of them in the Twin Cities metro, few in Northeast, few around St. Cloud, few around Winona, college areas, that provided enough votes to defeat the amendment statewide. But when you look at the geographic base, overwhelmingly, rural Minnesotans were saying, we're not ready for, for same-sex marriage yet. Now, whether or not that affected the elections in 2014, I don't know, anybody's guess. But it's clearly a value that is important to a lot of rural Minnesotans that the Republican majority in the House will have to deal with. Those kinds of, of social values. You have the, the, the speaker saying that um, we're going to devote more resources to rural bridges and, and roads but at the same time, drawing a line in the sand against new taxes, against new revenue. Pretty hard to square that circle. I mean, we can talk about waste, fraud, and abuse and eliminating that, fine. We can talk about stopping funding for transit programs, but keep in mind that much of the money for transit programs comes from the federal government. You can stop those programs, and it doesn't really add much to the kitty for, for roads and bridges in, in this state. You can talk about delivering more money for roads and bridges through bonding, and I think there will be some of that. But keep in mind, Republicans have been pretty adamant against letting the bonding bill grow too large. And then you have the realities of the state and keeping in mind that we never start with a clean slate. We're always dealing with what has come before us. And so what has come before us? Well, you have a stadium going up in downtown Minneapolis. And what no one has talked about is the huge hole in how that stadium is financed. Huge hole. And the backup plan? Take money out of general fund. And when you take money out of general fund, it allows less flexibility to do bonding, less flexibility to do some of the other projects in, in rural Minnesota and statewide. The legislature in the last session said, we're going to invest $500 million of state money in Destination Medical Center in Rochester. Great, terrific program. Will help a lot of rural Minnesota, I think, in, at least in southeastern Minnesota. But does anybody really think that the state is going to spend $500 million on projects within Rochester and Olmstead County and not build the fast train to Rochester from Rochester to the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport? I mean, it seems as if you're going to do one, you're going to do the other. 
and that's more money that gets sucked out of the potential transportation pool. And so you have those kinds of issues that I think even with the best of intentions from the, the speaker designate and the Republican caucus, it's just going to be very, very hard to, to square what they want to accomplish with the realities of what already has been promised with the, their, the, their own ideologies of, of their party that will make it difficult. And it's not just government that makes it difficult. What our research also found is that it's the other agenda setters who also contribute to the challenges of rural Minnesota. And so look at what has happened in, in the, the shift in who has influence. I mean, it wasn't long ago where if the Farm Bureau, the Farmers Union said something, it meant something. People paid attention. If the commodity group said something, it meant something. The timber industry, not so much anymore. Do a media review of how mining is covered. It's covered from an environmental perspective, and that's not to argue that it's right or wrong. It's simply to say that we don't talk about it through the metro media as much as an economic asset as we talk about its impact on, on the state's environment. Look who's gained stature as, as the agriculture, the farm organizations have lost influence. Education Minnesota, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, those organizations that largely have a metro focus. Go back and look at the agenda, the priorities for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce in this past session. Tax relief, reduced taxes, teacher evaluation, regulatory reform, eliminate waste and transportation, and again, some of those certainly are supported by rural Minnesota, some have benefit to rural Minnesota, but all of them make it more difficult for rural Minnesota to achieve some of the investment goals that it has. It just creates a very difficult political agenda. The other issue we found is, is the absence of a unifying voice. Who speaks for, for rural Minnesota? And you can look at that in, in a number of ways. One of the things we did find is that people in rural Minnesota think very, very highly of their local chambers of commerce. They see them as very important organizations. But look at the reality of a local chamber of commerce these days. If you're trying to maintain a membership base, if you're trying to maintain your job as economic, as executive director, all of the incentives are skewed to bringing in one or two jobs to my community, much more so than cooperating for some regional enterprise. I get rewarded when I can open a storefront on Main Street. Not so much if I open a, help open a new plant 15, 20 miles down the road. The incentives are to think small. I talked about the media. Look at the reality of the media as an agenda center, setter. When, when, when I started with, with Dave Durenberger, in 1978. We could deal with the Star and the Tribune with the Washington Bureau. I could call a Duluth Bureau. I could call somebody who was covering agriculture. I could call somebody who, whose job it was to travel rural Minnesota. And I could talk to a knowledgeable reporter about different issues and space would be devoted in the newspaper to those issues that affect rural Minnesota. Today, all those bureaus are closed. The newsrooms are smaller, not just in the, the Star Tribune, but in every news operation. Instead of having newspapers that, that exclusively not just cover, but also opinionate, editorialize Duluth, Bemidji, Brainerd, Worthington, Wilmer, on and on and on, now you know, common ownership common editorials, common voice, one legislative reporter. Where the media 
set an agenda for a lot of rural Minnesota because it knew rural Minnesota, because it was invested in rural Minnesota. Now that media more and more is focused on just the population center. And so the Star Tribune covers Minneapolis, the suburbs, some of St. Paul, not much, and a little bit of the eastern suburbs. And every so often, if there's a, a story of, of some crisis, we'll cover rural Minnesota. But where are the trend stories about rural Minnesota? Where are the thought pieces on rural Minnesota? They're not in the Star Tribune. They're not even in the local newspapers increasingly. And I think that's problematic. I think what it contributes, it was interesting, on, uh, earlier today, Peter Bell, um, former chair, in fact, Peter has served longer as chair of Metropolitan Council than anybody else. Smart guy. Peter was on Minnesota Public Radio early today, and, and he made the point that, that resonates with me a bit. He said that you know, while, while a lot of the political elites still talk about that Minnesota attitude of we're all in this together, fact is, fewer and fewer Minnesotans actually think that way. Well, what does that person in Lakeville really care about the struggling family in North Minneapolis? or North Mankato for that point. Increasingly, we're worried about how we can revive that notion that, that um, as one of the, the people told us in the, the research, Minnesota leaders and people need to think of the state as a whole rather than the Twin Cities and Greater Minnesota. They need to realize that each depends on the other for a strong economy. And we need leaders, we need organizations who will articulate that clearly and in compelling ways and then create agendas that go beyond ideology to act on it. So let me end on, on a bit of a positive note because I'm generally a glass half full kind of guy. So in 2013, Blandon Foundation did its Rural Pulse Survey. Great study, great research. And they found that 75% of, of rural Minnesotans think that their communities are strong, vibrant places to live. Great news. 85% agree that they can make an impact and make their communities even better places to live. Three-fourths agree that people in their communities work effectively together, and the youngest are the most optimistic. Really encouraging. But here's the concern. Only 38% and only 10% strongly agree, 38% agree, 10% strongly agree, that there are adequate job opportunities in my community that pay incomes sufficient to support a household. And one of the challenges is that what this survey found is that most rural Minnesotans see the solutions coming as mostly from the outside in. They think in terms of attracting new business instead of growing the opportunities that are there. Only 13% said that growing or maintaining existing local businesses is most important. We need to have a balance of both, and we need policies that support both. And we need organizations like the coalition that speak to that, that cooperation, that speak to that collaboration, that speak to that common agenda. And so our research asked, all right, what do we do about all of this? What are, what are a couple of things that ought to be done? And consistently, here are the three solutions that, that folks from rural Minnesota suggested, and I'll leave you with this. They said three keys. The first is that rural Minnesota needs more strategic collaboration among organizations that leverages the resources that distinguish rural Minnesota. What makes us unique? What are the strengths that we already have? What are the organizations that we can bring together, and how do we speak with, with a common voice? Secondly, a focused agenda that is supported by research that has value for policymakers. Not just 52% support, 48% oppose, but why? 
What engages Minnesotans? How do you tap into what that Rural Pulse survey found, that people want to be engaged, want to be involved? And so a focused agenda, supported by research. And third, a much stronger focus on educating private and, pol and public policymakers on the benefit of a strong rural Minnesota and the policies that will be needed to achieve that goal. Education, <coughs> connecting with people from around the state. And they made a point of saying it is both public policymakers and private policymakers. It is both educating those we elect to office but those who also influence the, the uh, public policies of the state. The heads of the, the business organizations, the editorial writers at newspapers, the reporters in broadcast media, the CEOs of major companies. It's those people who have influence that we need to, to reach out to. So with that, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. And if there's a couple minutes, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, let's take some questions. Oh, Dave Smigulski, right there. Uh, all of us, I think, in our communities have seen uh, evidence that young people that succeed or that thrive in rural communities are typically people that have had some time or have come from greater Minnesota, maybe went to the city, maybe went to wherever, college, and lived there for a while. And back or else never left. With that in mind, and with what you said about the idea of, of uh, you know, fair, fewer, a declining number of people having that tie to rural Minnesota, how do we, and I'm not sure if you can yeah. this one, but how do we grow that? Well, we're, we're working off a diminishing goal. Yeah. And it's, it's troubling because we have a, we have a, a vacancy in leadership opportunities coming up. Um, so, yeah, Dave, I don't have all the answers to that, but let me, let me give you a couple of suggestions. One is that I do think that, that there needs to be um, a more robust promotion of, of rural Minnesota. T talk to, I have three kids, 31, 28, and 26. I bet if I talk to any one of them, they would say, well, you know, I might like to live in a small town. I might like to live in rural Minnesota but boy, I can't get internet access out there. Well, that's not really the case. I mean, clearly there are pockets of problems. Clearly broadband needs to be a priority as the, the coalition has, has made it. But in a lot of areas of greater Minnesota now, not just Bemidji, although Bemidji leading the way, it, you know, great access to, to um, high-speed internet. But it's that perception that we have that, that um, because we've lost some of those, those connections, that rural Minnesota is, is this backwater area, void of good health care, good education, and, and access to arts and entertainment. It's not. We have to think differently about how we promote rural Minnesota and, and share with, with young people the opportunities that are out there, not just economically, but lifestyle. Yeah. Hi, Tom. I'm Eric Anderson, Mayor of Mankato. Mm -hmm. I recall, if I recall correctly, when you were down to your gubernatorial debate in Mankato, there was a number that stuck in my head. I believe at that time you mentioned something along the lines that about 40% of local government costs should be attributed to re a regulatory environment that many would deem excessive. As you look forward in your research and as you're looking ahead down the road, I got a two-part question. Number one, what do you think has been the role of higher education secondary education, the emphasis of trades and FFA programs and such, has that played a role in, in uh, effectively jettisoning younger people up to bigger urban populations where they believe their best opportunity is? Yeah. And secondly, do you think that you ever see a, a, a change in that environment, that regulatory environment, that may allow future entrepreneurs a chance to roll the dice again, ostensibly in outside um, good questions. Um, so, so on the first one, education. You know, I thought one of the great lost opportunities of, of the last four years was 
in in 2011, we had the convergence of a new governor, a new president of the University of Minnesota, and a new chancellor for, for Minskew all coming in at the same time. And I thought it was just what a wonderful opportunity to sit down and say, how do we really redesign higher education for the future? What is it that we really want? How do we reduce costs, not just freeze tuition, but how do we actually reduce costs while expanding access? And I think it can be done. We lost that opportunity. So I'd back up and I'd say, you know, I think that, that there are some positive signs that, that ought to be embraced. I think some of the, the Minsky schools are doing a really good job now of working with industry. I know um, with, with Bruce up in, in Detroit Lakes, they can't find enough people to fill all of the manufacturing jobs in, in Detroit Lakes. And a lot of that has to do with the, the work that they've done with the, the local vocational school to, to train and, and develop workers. But I think we have to look beyond that. Um, so look at, at the challenge of um, the early options education in secondary school. So right now, juniors and seniors can go to their local community college. They can get credit toward a traditional four-year degree. I think what we ought to do, and I think this would be helpful to, to, to rural Minnesota, is expand that so that that kid who says, you know what, I really want to practice a trade. Let that kid go to, to a vocational school as a junior or senior, get the resources there that high schools can't afford to offer, and get college credit for it in the same way that, that his counterpart or her counterpart gets credit for the liberal arts education or the BS education. I think that would help rural Minnesota. If we just start thinking differently about that, you know, I think we have to think differently about online education. And so I don't think it's the, the solution to everything. I mean, I, I think there's, there's great value in, in that campus experience. I mean, you know, think back to, to those of you who, who graduated from college. I mean, think back to your most memorable experience in college. Okay, now think of your second most memorable experience. <laughs> yeah, maybe the third, yeah. <laughs> okay. But I would bet that any of the top three or four or five didn't occur in the classroom. You know, they, they, they occurred as part of the campus experience. So I think there is some value to that. But I also think that, that there is a great opportunity to, to really expand the, the reach and the lifelong learning of, of education. So, you know, so I, I, I don't know, Mayor, if that's directly responsive, but I think there are a lot of things that, that we can do in higher education. On the regulatory side, I, I think that, that it is a huge opportunity for the Republican House to come in with, with a thoughtful strategy that, that says not just waste, fraud, and abuse, but here's how we can make a better Minnesota. Here's how we can protect those values that are important to Minnesotans around the environment and natural resources and those traditional values while still having more streamlined processes. You know, I thought what, what has occurred over the last couple of years with all of the hoopla around regulatory relief mostly has been frittering around the edges without a lot of, of substance. I think that's one area where, where Republicans really could define an agenda, a positive agenda, and, and speak to both the values but also the importance of having a streamlined uh, regulatory process and, and move forward with that. So I have some hope, but boy, you, you know, the person sitting to your left knows better than anybody else how difficult it is. I mean, those those agencies get their claws into to, um, different regulations and hard to let go. Uh, Mark Homer, city manager at Sleepy Eye. Tom, <clears throat> tell me what you think was the difference between the trend that seemed to happen in the upper Midwest uh, in the elections. And Minnesota was a little bit different than most of the states around it. Um, tell me why you think that was the case uh, compared to Wisconsin, for example. Yeah. Um, so first of all, did you hear that there was a moose spotted today in Sleepy Eye? <laughs> and they say climate change isn't real. Um, so so he, he, um, I think there are a number of, of reasons. One is that I do think that Minnesota Republicans at the statewide level 
um, have done a poor job of articulating a clear vision that distinguishes them um, in a state that traditionally has been progressive, traditionally has been in favor of government intervention. Um, they have not done a good job of, of educating Minnesotans on why we ought to think differently. I'll give you one example. Um, I, I, I've long been a supporter of significant tax reform. I think we have to change a tax system that now taxes um, savings and investment to one that taxes consumption. Not just for job creation, but just math. <laughs> you know, we're a state that is growing older with a workforce that, that will not increase. We're simply not going to have as much earned income to tax. For that reason alone, we, we ought to change it. I think Republicans had a great opportunity in 2009 when Governor Pawlenty's own commission came back and said, here's a new vision. And I think that, that there were enough Democrats that maybe they could have gotten something done. I think it's those kinds of issues that Republicans in Minnesota have to articulate. You know, I don't certainly agree with, with everything Scott Walker has, has stood for, but he has been clear in his vision in articulating what makes him different from, from um, his Democratic opponents. So I think that's the, the, the first challenge. The second challenge is that I think when, when re Republicans have, have had the opportunity, they've either not done enough or they've done too much. So the obvious example is, is 2012, uh, or actually 2011, when they put on the, the ballot the two constitutional amendments on marriage and, and voter um, fraud. And I think a lot of Minnesotans are saying, look, we still aren't sure we've come out of the recession. We're still having a lot of challenges. We're still not sure we're on the right track. Why are you screwing around with that? Do something positive. Help me get to, to, to a job that is going to pay me a middle class life uh, wage. Don't fool around with that. I think some of the same is true during the, the Palenti years. I think there was a, a, a sense that we had an opportunity to build on the great strengths and assets that Minnesota has, and, and Republicans haven't done enough. So I think it's for all of those reasons that, that Minnesota, I, you know, and I'd also say, and I'd be the first to acknowledge, so I supported Jeff Johnson in, in this year's campaign. Um, but I think that, that um, Republicans did not have great candidates haven't had great candidates in many statewide races for the, the last many years, um, with some exceptions. Um, and, and, and I also think that because of the financial problems that the party has, the Republican Party in Minnesota has, the Democrats are, are light years ahead in um, just the technology of campaigns, in, in identifying voters, direct communications. You know, the, the, the problem with TV advertising these days is that we all know how to work that video recorder. I mean, we can all fast forward through through ads, and yet they're very expensive. Republicans have lost that, and they've also, you know, the, the, the Democrats have done a very, very good job with their independent expenditure groups of, of, of figuring out how to coordinate, how to drive consistent messages, and, and they've raised a lot more money. Republicans have been pretty dispersed in, in their messaging and a lot less money to spend. Juan Miller, Alexandria, Minnesota, and um, current, now we now have a brand new high school, mm -hmm. and we've gone through the academies, which uh, is a partnership between the businesses and the high school, and also uh, has some of the latest technology in there for manufacturing and, and medical and, and all of the, the four different academies that they use. And then we tie that in with our community and technical college, which also has a mm -hmm. great partnership between the businesses and developing uh, young people for to try to stay in the community. So we have the resources now. We have the job availability. I guess it still gets down to the question, how do we retain that young people there? Yeah. Well, and, and, and again, I don't know that I have all of the answers or even any of the answers, but I do think part of it is making sure that, that people truly understand what rural Minnesota is and the opportunities that are available in, in rural Minnesota. Not just the economic opportunities, but the lifestyle opportunities. And I think sometimes that gets lost in, in all of the shuffle. 
I, mean, I think that, that there needs to be a strong, compelling effort to, to promote rural Minnesota. And yet, look, what, what most people know and hear about rural Minnesota, if they don't have a direct connection, is what they see in, in social media or the mainstream media. So, you know, what's been the story the last couple of days? Well, local hospitals are closing because Mayo wants to concentrate everything in, in Rochester. Well, the fact is there are a lot of good, great healthcare resources in, in rural Minnesota. But I read one story like that and I think, boy, that's rural Minnesota. I can't get to a hospital if I need it. I don't want to take that chance. I think there needs to be an effort to, to separate fact from fiction about rural Minnesota and, and make that compelling case that it is a terrific lifestyle. You know, okay, one more question, then that's it, Tom. Yeah, no, just make a comment. You know, it's not uncommon for Odana to have kids graduate from high school or college in eight for 10 years. But they want to come back to the community to raise their family. They want to raise their family. Yep. The education system. So we need to do a better job of selling that very issue. Yes. And it's not uncommon for us to have CEOs come into our companies to run our companies, but their family and their wife want to live in the metropolitan area, and who's got the power? It's not those guys. It's the wives that are going to move into the metropolitan area. Yeah. Well, and, and to that point, I, I mean, I think that gets to state policy that too often is designed just for, for metro Minnesota. So is anybody here from Pequot Lakes? Okay, then I can tell this anecdote. Great. So, <laughs> and it's actually true. So, so in, in 2010, I was in Pequot Lakes, and they were telling me that, that because of open enrollment and choice, that every morning at the same corner, four buses from four different school districts come to pick up kids from Pequot Lakes and, and go out to other districts. Because some kid, you know, wants the sports program over here. One kid wants the early closing over here, so they can go to a job. What, whatever the reason. Well, so, so choice and open enrollment might make a lot of sense in the metro area. It doesn't make a great deal of sense for for Pequot Lakes. It it, it undermines the quality, the resources available to, to that school. I think one of the things that needs to happen is that. We need more thoughtful conversation that, yes, we're one state, but we're one state with a lot of differences. And, and we ought to reflect those differences. And we're smart enough to figure out what's fair policy that says we're going to do it this way in Pequot Lakes, but we'll do it, I, I keep saying Pequot, I meant Pelican Rapids, I'm sorry. We're going to do it this way in Pelican Rapids, we're going to do it this way in, in um, you know, Edina or, or the, the, the whole metro area on health care and education, on, on roads and transportation in a lot of areas. I think that's part of the challenge, and it's a particular challenge for, for the House of Representatives coming into next year is to say, look, this is an agenda for Minnesota that understands that we are one state with a lot of differences. And we ought to celebrate those differences. And we ought to make sure that everybody understands the value of recognizing those differences and having policy that, that reflects, embraces, and supports those, those kinds of differences. I appreciate it. You've been terrific. Thank you very much.